But I really appreciate being invited here and, and uh, great to be back on the island. It's kind of a, a bit of fun for me. I get here once in a while. I was here a month ago talking about winter wheat. And as Ryan says, I'll, I'll talk about almost anything agronomy. I'm just one of those guys that uh, just loves crop and stuff. So uh, I will start by saying a couple of things. If you want to get, I, I live on feedback. So please, as we go through this, if you have questions, stop me, ask. Uh, it, you know, this is the third time in two days I've given this presentation. And if you guys don't stop me, I'm going to be bored out of my skull. So uh, if you have any questions, please, please jump in. Uh, this is my contact information, it's the only time it'll be up there, but uh, I'm happy to take questions at any time. You can tweet me, you can email me, you can text me, you can call me. If you email me, it might take me a day to get back to you because my inbox is, is fairly busy, but uh, I, yeah, that's, that's part of how I learn is when people ask me questions. I just learn from and figuring out what the answer are if, or is to those questions. Brian uh, mentioned that I uh, do a little bit of work with real agriculture, so I do a podcast. Boy, that, that looks big on that screen, Ryan. That's a big screen. Holy crap, look at that. Anyway, uh, I do a, a weekly podcast, so what's fun about that podcast is if you ask me a question, I will answer it on an upcoming episode, and so basically that's what that podcast is, people just asking me questions. And I, I even get potato questions once in a while. I have a, a fairly a large group of Amish and, and Mennonite farmers that, that, that's why we have the phone number. We'd rather you didn't call the phone number. It costs us a lot of money to have that phone number, but those Amish people don't have a computer, so they don't podcast it. And so they will call in and, yep, they will ask me about growing potatoes in their garden that they put on 25 million ton of pig manure or, or dairy manure onto and wonder why they have problems with their potatoes. And it's kind of like, yeah, maybe it's a little too much nitrogen or whatever. It's just a bit of fun. The other thing that we do do, uh, and I'm, I'm part of this, but Sean Haney, the owner of Real Egg, I give him a lot of credit. Anybody on satellite radio? Listen, oh, a couple at the back, yeah. So satellite radio series 147 is rural radio, to, uh, agriculture 24 hours a day, seven days a week, until two and a half years ago, where was their agriculture on the face of the globe? The United States of America. She was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, U.S. agriculture. Two and a half years ago, we got one hour a day. So from 4.30 till 5.30, we now have Canadian agriculture that's on Sirius satellite radio. And that has been so much fun for a guy like me because I now get questions from all over the globe. So I have a grower in South Africa. His average wheat yield is 160 bushels per acre. And he's emailing me all his tissue samples saying, how can I get you know, higher wheat yields? And I think, wait a minute, you know, my, my best wheat yield ever is 120 bushels per acre and your average is 160 and you're coming to me for, for advice? Like, it's quite bizarre. I have another grower in Pakistan that grows wheat under flood <coughs> irrigation. So what is one of the things that wheat hates the most? Wet feet, right? Like, and wheat hates wet feet, and they're flood irrigating. So we actually got them growing wheat on beds now and, and furrow irrigating, and they've, they've got way better wheat. So it's just, it's fun, eh? Because all the principles of agronomy apply, and they apply regardless of where you are in the world. It's just how does that climate interact with the agronomic principles and where does it play out in terms of trying to pull that together. So that's my one minute of, of shameless self-promotion, but, but I, I really enjoy doing that every week and, and I live on the feedback. So uh, Ryan did mention the Ontario Compaction Team and I'm only a part of that Ontario Compaction Team. Uh, there's some real drivers, Ian McDonald and Alex Berry from Omafra, Jake Cranbrink from Edgar Brink. So all of the stuff here that I'll present today is, is a team effort. It's not just me, it's absolutely a team effort. Thefieldcropnews.com. Oh, do you have batteries, Ryan? Oh, um, yep. Sorry, this thing's going to You can just see that. We've been using it uh, uh, for a couple of days. So anyway, thefieldcropnews.com website. Sorry about that, thanks. Uh, is is where all of, I'm going to at the end of the presentation or towards the end of the presentation I'm going to show you a bunch of comparative graphs 
where we look at running equipment over sensors and how the, the uh, relate to one another. You gotta be really careful with the graphs. You can't take a graph from one of the days we've done at Dundas and compare it with the graph that we did at Arthur because every installation is a little different, but comparatively they are the same. All of that information uh, on this is gonna be housed on fieldcropnews.com. And so you can go there to pick it up. Right now it's on ifao.com, but they don't want to uh, house it anymore. So, so they're looking at, at finding a different spot. So that's sort of where we're going to be. Okay, cool. Let's go. What do you think? I'm causing some compaction there? No compaction? <laughs> I, you know, craziness. All craziness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, we all get into those situations once in a while. In fact, some guys say if they don't get stuck three or four times, uh, you know, when they first start seeding, they're not out there early enough. I'm, I'm a big early seeding guy, but that's maybe just a tad early. So here's a, a little video from our very first compaction day. I'll try and get out of the way over here. And I want you to tell me what you think. So that's the tractor. Here's the manure, manure tanker. So what do you think? Crazy. Thanks, Ryan. Compaction? Yes. Yep. So how much is that going to impact yield? 50%. 50%. How long is it going to take for that for you to correct that? Can you correct that? So not this season. Not this season? Yeah, so, so this is this is a kind of, I find it really, really uh, amazing. This is the third time in my career that I've talked about compaction. And it's the first time in my career that I actually have some decent answers for how we can deal with this. And that's why we're back talking about it. Like I, the other two times when we talked about compaction, we said, well, you know, don't go on the soil when it's wet. Well, good luck with that. So I farm a little bit, and you know, 2019 was a good spring, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it was the same in Ontario. And on the 10th of May, I could have planted corn. The field was 70% fit and 30% not fit, and I have a 90-10 rule. If it's 90% fit, 10% not fit, you can't wait any longer, you go plant. On the 10th of May, 70-30, it's too wet. We're not planting, we're waiting. On the 10th of June, it was 60% fit and 40% too wet, and I planted the field, right? Because the calendar trumps soil conditions. Like, you just get to that point. So the other two times we went through compaction, I said, don't plant wet. Well, come on. It's, it's easy to stand at the front of the room and say, but as a grower, I know that you just get in situations when you're, you have to do it wet. Absolutely. And the other thing, and it's still true, you want to not cause compaction, don't use that great big heavy manure tanker, use all light equipment. How's that working out for you? The equipment getting lighter or heavier? Getting lighter. Getting lighter, yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's kind of a bit of fun in terms of, of this. And so how long did it take, by the way, for my video to run? How long did that take? Take five seconds, seven seconds, something like that? So, and, and by the way, he was driving really slow to make a point. Yeah. And, and this is the problem, right? We can compact the soil within seconds, but it takes decades to correct it. And so we have to find ways where we don't cause that compaction. And I think, I think as we go on, we'll show you some things that, that actually uh, we can do not to cause the compaction, or at least to cause a lot less compaction, and I think that, that's good for agriculture. So, anybody in the room ever had a, a CT scan, computer tomography? You know, go to the hospital and have one of those? Yeah, you've had one absolutely on your back for sure. Yeah, so I've had one. This is com computer tomography of the soil. And so, essentially what we're doing is looking inside the soil, just like they look inside your body and see what's going on. We're looking inside the soil and seeing what's going on. And this is after we've compacted it. So that's about a 36 uh, PSI tire. 
with a 10 ton per axle load. So this is not at all excessive, but it's fairly typical. What do you notice, pre-impact, post-impact? Oh, but first off, what's the green? What's the green? I'm looking inside the soil, what's the green? Air. air. So it's pore space. Pore space yeah. So it's both air and water, mm -hmm. right? And a, and a healthy soil is 50% solids, 25% water, 25% air, right? Mm -hmm. So this is fairly healthy soil. It's hard to tell if it's, you know, 50% solids or whatever, but it's it's in that game. But it's not just it's not just air space, it's also water-filled space. So what do you immediately have noticed pre-impact and post-impact? The space is smaller. Yeah, so there's less, right? There's less pore space. What else do you notice? Yeah, the depth is quite tight and what's even worse. Yeah, so so when we get down here, we don't have as much maybe impact. So the most impact is closest to the surface. That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. The one thing though that I really want you to notice is think about this. We had a four inch rain in January, right? It just happened. Mother Nature does that to us anymore. And on a Saturday, a Friday night, Saturday morning in January, we got a four inch rain. If I had a four inch rain on that particular block of soil, what's going to happen? If I have a four inch rain on that block, what's going to happen? So, so what we have is connectivity, right? So those pores are all connected so the water can get down into the profile. Whereas over here, I get that four inch rain. Am I getting infiltration? And the answer is not very much. And so what happens particularly if that, that's on a slope, right? It's a tire that's run up that slope. What happens with the four inch rain? Big exactly, erosion. big erosion. And so one of the things about compaction that we haven't put together very well is that compaction makes the soil far more prone to erosion because we just don't get that infiltration. And if you were a root, which block would you rather grow in? <laughs> right? So the root can grow down that channel or down that channel and find that channel. And, like, there's lots of <coughs> easy paths for the root to grow, whereas over here, there's no easy paths. And so we're going to get less root growth, we're going to get uh, an impact yield, we'll show you that, but, but the big ones are really water infiltration, and does it make a difference how much water's in the soil? Mm -hmm. I absolutely think so. In the middle, of, it got dry here last year, right? In July, August, so you want that water in the soil, and then the erosion factor is one of those things that, that we just haven't thought about with compaction. So here's... Here's the other thing. You guys do any tile drainage or a yeah. little bit? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big tile drainage guy because on my farm, if I don't have tile drainage, I can't farm, right? It's this clay loam soil and, well, you could farm, but you'd plant, you know, way later and you just wouldn't get the yield. Big gains. But you think about our farming practices, what we've done in the last... 40, 50 years. So I've farmed there since 1985. I bought that farm in 85. It was tile drained at 50 foot centers in 1972. When I bought the farm in 85, I'm a wheat guy, so I'm a, I'm a religion, almost, rotation is almost a religion. It's corn, soybeans, wheat. Underseed the wheat, go back to corn. So, you know, you kind of think, I'm trying to be as good a farmer as I can be from a rotation standpoint, using cover crops, doing hopefully all the right things, because dang it, if I'm going to stand in front of you guys and talk the talk, I better walk the walk. So I thought I was a decent farmer. Bought that farm in 85, and the wheat was uniform, perfect. You could not see where the tile lines were. By the year 2000, all of a sudden, it's, you can pick out the tile lines. Like, it's, wheat's better over the tile lines. And wheat's still okay between the tile lines. I had that farm in, two, in 2008 in wheat again, and all of a sudden, the tile lines, 10 feet over the tile lines, the wheat's awesome. And in between, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse until I get to the next tile line again. So if you think about that, what's happening? If I have my tiles 50 feet apart, how far does the water have to move to get to the tile? 25 feet. That's not rocket science. So in 85, was the water moving laterally 25 feet? Absolutely. 
In 2008, was it moving 25 feet? Why not? What had happened? And so what had happened goes right back to, to this picture is over that time frame, and I, I didn't have that big of equipment, but my combine still, you know, was a heavy combine on bias ply small tires. And what we do is we drive that compaction down in here where we need that lateral water movement, and we stop the lateral water movement. And so in that time frame, even thinking I was a good farmer, I had essentially buggered up my subsoil enough I wasn't getting that lateral water movement. What did I do to solve it? I split the tile. They're now at 25 feet. Uh, that farm was in, in wheat last year, and you could not find the tiles. She looked, you know, it was a terrible year, but nonetheless, you couldn't find the tiles. And at the end of the day, it ran 99 bushel per acre winter wheat, which for 2019 was pretty doggone good. But if I keep doing what I'm doing, what am I going to have to do 20 years from now? Split exactly. <laughs> Split them again. We'll be at 12 and a halfs. And I just think that that is the wrong, f like, like splitting the tiles fixed the problem, but it didn't solve what's creating the problem. And we got to solve what's creating the problem. So I get lots of questions always about the impact of frost. So what do you think here? What's causing that? Compaction factor. Yeah, so absolutely. Those are tracks. What do you think the yield loss is in those tracks? <coughs> She's pretty big, right? She's pretty big. It's kind of like that manure tanker going over the soil and doing nothing. So, yeah. So there's what it looked like. That's the same field. This, by the way, is the Peace River District. And they didn't get the crop harvested one fall, which happens in Peace. It's up in northern Alberta. And about one year and five, they just winter comes in or the crop is too late. They don't get it out of the field. Would you have stopped combining that field because you were making those kind of tracks? No. Not a chance. You've got to get the crop out of the field, right? right? So here's the difference. They took the crop off in the spring. And by the way, that combine was on tracks. So from a compaction standpoint, you would say, man, it shouldn't be causing much compaction. But it's in the spring. And so we have no freeze-thaw cycles. And he's a no-till grower, so he didn't do any tillage. And without those, if he'd have done that in the fall, you wouldn't have seen it in the crop at all, right? Because Mother Nature would help you. But when he does it in the spring and doesn't do anything to correct them, then we end up with this. Now, how about deep compaction? How much good does frost do you for deep compaction? Nothing. What do you think? We, our family used to grow tobacco, and we had a chisel plow, and the thing is, a, a tractor is somewhat too small for a seven-foot seven chisel plow. Yep. We'd go probably about 10, maybe 12 inches, of, and there was, uh, if there was no, no uh, frost gone in, go another two or so, just with the same tractor, same, yeah, just, uh, so even two inches more, Loosened up. Right. But from a frost perspective, like you were going deeper without frost, you mean? Or uh, when the frost when we when it did freeze, then we were able to go go a bit deeper. Yeah, so it so the frost did a little bit, right? So, you know, it's not big, big, but it's still another two inches of soil. <laughs> yeah. So like at the surface, how many times does the frost go in and come out? Depending on the winter. Right, but even a winter with snow cover like this, once the snow goes, it, it's going to happen several times, right? Generally speaking, in the fall before the snow comes, you get several. How many times does it go in at depth? Maybe once. Maybe once. Is, is it gone in at depth at all this year? No. no. So this year, we don't get any deep frost. So freeze-thaw cycles make a huge impact to soil surface. If you're farming in Australia, and they get surface compaction. They don't get freeze-thaw cycles, and so compaction at the surface is a, a huge problem for them. But for us, surface compaction, that top inch or, or inch and a half, two inches, those repeated freeze-thaw cycles do a lot of good, just like that in the Peace River District. But if you think for one minute that deep frost is going to solve your deep compaction, 
We just, it doesn't go in and come out often enough. So does it help? Sure, it helps. It helps this much, yeah. but it doesn't solve, because if it solved the problem, I wouldn't have had to split my tile, right? Mm -hmm. So deep frost doesn't solve our problem. The surface is different, the deep frost just isn't. So uh, what about tillage? So I'm a no-till guy, right? And by the way, I know, I know you're potato farmers and you cannot farm potatoes without tillage. I totally get that. So I'm not going to stand here and say, grow no-till potatoes, because that ain't going to work, right? But I'm a big, like, the less tillage you can do, the better, because every time you do tillage, you break up the aggregate structure, and you don't get as good water infiltration. I mean, we've, we've all sorts of science behind that, so let's do as little as we can. If you're going to grow potatoes, you've got to hell the stupid things, or, you know, like they get sunburned, and they don't, like, you, you just have to. But in terms of compaction, so this is, is uh, data out of Switzerland, but a fairly similar climate actually to what we have, a little different, but not that much different. So there's one compaction event. Now it was a fairly significant co compaction event, but one compaction event, and then they said, okay, let's see what happens after we do that without any tillage to fix it at all. Just compact it and then grow the crop 90% yield loss. So that's like that canola field where it compacted it that I showed you the pictures of, right? It, up in the Peace River did. That's about a 90% yield loss likely. Horrendous. With tillage, they went out there, they did all the tillage they could. They still had a 20% yield loss. So does compaction make a big uh, yield hit? The answer is absolutely. You just, you just don't see it because it's tough to see that 20% that yield loss, you can, but it's, it's not as easy as you might think. Even a year later, with all the tillage they could do, they still lost 10% in yield. So it just takes time, and in my no-till situation without tillage, we come back faster, and we know we come back faster, but I'm still, I mean, I'm, oh, I'm winning big, I only have a 40% yield loss, Ooh-ha. right? So, so just pretty significant stuff. So this is the next part. How much of the field do you compact? And this is data out of Ohio State. And it just, until I saw this, I, I wouldn't have imagined this. But you look at like a 36-row planter. So that's a planter that's over 100 feet wide, right? 36-row planter. And that planter is still compacting 7% of the field. If you have a... a 40-foot combine, a 16-row combine, compacts 17% of the field. You have the grain cart. Does the grain cart compact the same part of the field as the combine? Not likely. No. So it's got 14%. You can't run a 16-row combine without a grain cart. So between the grain cart and the combine, I compact 30% of the field. How much of the field are you guys compacting with your stupid potato equipment? Lots. Lots. 100%, right? Yeah, pretty much. Like it just... Like, so, like it's, it's, the amount that we compact is absolutely bizarre. And how much does that, does that matter? Well, this is the Ohio, Ohio data, and if it's wet, man, we're getting basically a 25% yield loss. We're losing 25% in yield. Is that, is that, you know, something we should pay attention to? And I think the answer is, wow, that's one of those things that we got we to gotta look at. So, a little more data, and I apologize, I'm a data guy, and I, I will drown you in data a little bit, but hopefully it makes a point and we'll get past this and, and, and maybe not to totally put you to sleep. This surface compaction, and what they did in this study, it was every year they went out when it was just a little bit too wet, and they compacted it, and they did it every year, every year. And what you see happening is we get this just... Over time, it just keeps building, and we end up with almost a 20% yield loss. With just surface compaction, <coughs> not deep compaction, just surface compaction. I look at that, this and say, okay, but if, I, if I'm a good manager and I have a little bit of patience on the years when I can have patience, not 2019, because <laughs> just, it just you got to the point where you couldn't have patience, but uh, there's other years, just wait that extra day and do a good job. I think, I think we can get away from most of this. But here's the one that I think really hits us hard, hardest. So this is one compaction event. 
We compacted it here at depth. And then we farmed it for the next, we're at year 13, and what you see is that there is a 3% permanent yield loss. One compaction event, not repeated compaction events. We're doing repeated compaction events, right? On my farm, when it's wet <coughs> at corn harvest, I'm in the snow belt. I gotta get the corn off the field before the snow hits, because we can get five feet of snow pretty quickly coming off Lake Huron. You get five feet of snow, it, it's all bad on a corn crop, right? Like, she, she just is all bad. So, I don't know, I don't, not every fall is wet, but I'm certainly not just doing one compaction event. From one compaction event, I'm getting a 3% permanent loss even in year 13. And that, to me, is scary. Because the frost isn't fixing it, and I can't get deep enough with my deep ripper my, my tillage equipment to fix it. And that's one compaction event. So that really kind of uh, puts it in, in perspective. Well, so we're about here. Talk, uh, deep compaction, how deep are you talking? Yeah, so deep compaction, that's a great question. You missed the mark just a tad, right? <laughs> just a tad. Uh, but so deep compaction, like how deep can you run a, a deep ripper and fix things? Uh, you could, like, the, maybe you can get to 15 inches, but. Uh, so, deep compaction to me is anything over a foot, basically. Uh, the equipment today, some of the equipment today, and we'll get to that in a second, is so heavy that we're driving compaction at least three feet deep into the soil. So the heavier the equipment is, the deeper the compaction goes. And when I'm talking deep compaction, so that they, they know that they compacted down at, at least at 24 inches in that particular study. But your potato, you drive that stinking potato truck over the field, trust me, it's going at least mm -hmm. 20 inches, if not two feet deep in terms of compaction. It just, oh, and by the way, you're all potato growers, right? So you're all on sandy soil. And sand doesn't compact, correct? Wrong. Yeah, dry call, sand doesn't. Your sand doesn't. No, dry sand. Oh, dry sand doesn't, yeah. I, I call bullshit on sand doesn't compact. Okay. What do we build roads out of? Right? We compact the sand so that we get a firm base. <coughs> sand will compact. I actually have on my desk from a sand farm, and way back in 1986 when I first started, we went out to a sand grower has an, having all sorts of problems. We dug down, got down about eight inches, and then the shovel wouldn't go in the ground. And I have a block of, of, that we dug out to need a pickaxe to get it out about that big on my desk. You could hit that thing with a sledgehammer pretty near and it will not break up. And so that sand soil absolutely compacts. You just have to get over that. I have a random question. So it has to do with the deep tillage thing. So what do you do when half your farm's on a shale pit? <laughs> Buy another farm. We're going to have to move out of the province. <laughs> you know, we don't want to move to New Brunswick because they got big stumps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so... No, so so like when you're talking tillage, like it's yes, we do we do subsoiling and we do like tillage work, but it's always a struggle because even when we're mow board plowing or any kind of tillage, we can take up stones the size of your coffee table in your house. I guarantee it, it'll get lodged. Like there's layers of shale and yeah. stone to get pushed up in the spring with the frost, and you're the, like that tillage is important, but. We're also running potato trucks. You talk about like that vehicle there with the air controlling the air pressure and all that. We're running ten wheelers with a hundred pounds of pressure in each in dual tires that are this wide, running sixty thousand pounds, gross vehicle weight, up the field in every condition. Oh, a truck won't move. We'll contract on it. <laughs> and it will go. Yeah. No, I and so I, I think. That's exactly where we want to get, is what do we do about that, right? right? Yeah. And as far as you're, you're bringing up the big rocks, yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the farm you, you bought. No, I realize that, but like, where's the minimum you can till, and yet, like, if you go down only 12 inches, like, I know you're not going to go below <clears> that, but can, if you do that in the fall, can you shatter that enough that the water will infiltrate and sort of, yeah, so, help to assist. So, so let me start off by saying that I am not a deep tillage guy. I, I really don't like deep tillage, but if you compact it at depth, then sometimes you have to do something to try and fix it. 
So I'm going to come back and say, can, is there a way we cannot compact it at depth? If we could stop that, then we don't need that deep ripper. The other thing that I'll say is, you deep rip, and you said in the fall. So you deep rip when it's wet in the fall, and you don't get lift and shatter, and all you've done is cut a slot for the water to go down, right? right. And, and you're not going to get near, like, it, the benefit is very small. <clears throat> the other thing that you need is, you, even if you do it when it's dry, so are reasonably dry, moist, and you get good lift and shatter, so that's all nice loose soil. Well man, if you don't have roots to grow through that, it's not stable. It's a bit like a cultivator at the surface, right? You cultivate the surface and get a three inch pounding rain, what do you get? It, it consolidates, right? You get a crust, maybe not on your sands, but if you have any silt or clay in there, you get a crust and then every, like, things won't come up through it. Well man, you loosen that up, and then it's wet, and you drive over it with that stupid potato truck again, and all you do is recompact it because there's nothing that's stabilized it. So if you want to make deep tillage work, you have to do the deep tillage when it's moist, so you get the fracture, and you have something growing that has enough time to put roots down and <coughs> loosen to stabilize it so that you've got some structure there in what you've loosened to keep it apart. Right. And so, to me, deep tillage can be part of the solution. And you're thinking, you're calling it like just a foot, like you're just talking, when you call it deep tillage? We're going to talk about um, yeah. subsoiling a little bit, okay. too, in my presentation, yeah. a little bit, where we okay. did some trial work last year. Too. Yeah, and, I, and so that's good, Ryan. Yeah. Ryan will uh, talk no, about okay. just like determine it. Go back to yep. Chris's question about the deep tillage, because like, say, the, the shale that we're dealing with, like, the, like I got enough work. That I don't need to be have like somebody else. I, know, I don't need another crew picking stones. Yeah, so you got to be like the guys in Newfoundland and get one of those crushers, right, and just run it through the field and just what grind them all up into soil, baby. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? Yep. Have there ever been any studies done on how how compact the soil uh, tillage radish can can still? Push its roots down. Oh, tillage radish, man! You hit one of my. Yeah, you're going to get me on my my. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> let me start with. I love I love all cover crops. All cover crops are good because you want to get better soil. You need organic matter. And I went to university. I graduated in 1982. Uh, there's actually a couple of years when I behind when I should have, but that's a long time ago. Uh, yeah, it's a long story. We don't need to get into it. Anyway, uh, and at least half the stuff that I learned in university about organic matter has now been proven to be wrong. So it's good. So the answer can change on new information. Science is good that way. And what we've learned is that if you want to make organic matter, you've got to grow roots. So what really makes organic matter is root exudates and... Uh, just the, the fungal hyphae and, and it's bug poop. And how do you feed bugs? You get root exudates. So when you look at any cover crop, you're growing more roots, so that's good. And then we get into the tillage radish because there's been people say that, man, you want to solve compaction, grow tillage radish, grow nitro radish. You know, like, oh, my, look at that root. <laughs> Dig it up once. If you have a compacted zone and the tillage radish roots going down, what happens? Oh. Sideways. And then what happens to the tillage radish root? It grows up, right? And I've seen tillage radish roots, honest to goodness, I've seen tillage <coughs> radish roots that are a foot high out of the soil. And people are saying, oh, look at what it's doing for compaction. I dig the stupid thing up and the, this little wee root at the end has gone sideways and finally found a crack through and gone down through. And if I had oats growing there, or whatever, she'd do the same thing. Those fibrous roots would come down and it'd hit and it'd go sideways until they found that crack and they'd go through. Tillage radish doesn't have enough time to do anything at all for deep compaction. Will a taproot fix deep compaction? The answer is yes. You want to fix compaction? Grow dandelion. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious, but dandelion has a really good taproot, and the stupid thing will keep growing, and if you get a bushel basket sized dandelion, pretty much for sure it's had enough time to get that root penetrated through. Alfalfa, because you grow it for three years, 
And so that alfalfa root is growing when the soil is wet. When the soil is wet, it's a lot more pliable. The root has a better chance to push through. And so over three years, that alfalfa root will get through and break up some of that deep compaction. Now that assumes that you're not a dairy farmer and you're not cutting the stupid alfalfa as soon as the last raindrop hits the ground and not out there with this massive, stinking, great, huge forge harvester a day later blowing it in the silo when the soil's too wet because the next rainstorm's coming and quality is everything. So I gotta be a little careful on alfalfa, alfalfa but if you, if you don't abuse the soil harvesting the alfalfa, the alfalfa root will fix it because it's there for three years. It has the time to do it. Your tillage radish, I love it as a cover crop. It's growing roots. It's all good. But if you think for a second it's fixing your compaction, not a chance. It just isn't going to do that. So. From what I'm reading, and I do more more reading than anything, there's, it, it, that it gives food for the earthworms and the life in the soil. And, and so does oats and barley and... Uh, alfalfa and dandelions, they all give root, so it's, it's good, but the root itself, it's not fixing your compaction, it's just not, and we've seen that time and time and time again. Anyway, uh, yep? What about just normal hay, if not alfalfa? Yeah, so when you say normal hay, what are you talking about? Red yeah. clover and timothy? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, timothy, what a useless crop. <laughs> Holy but. <laughs> one cut, one cut, and that's all you, you want to grow real grass, grow orchard grass. I know everybody hates orchard grass because it heads too early and gets too stemmy, but man. Brome grass, that's your grass. <laughs> yeah, it's not as good, anyways, it's just not. It, but no, so so the problem with your, your red, or well actually, your red clover has a weaker taproot, but it'll still do it. Your, and your grass is, like, how deep will a grass root go? Anybody? Three feet. Three feet? That's yeah. So it, it depends on how hard the ground is and where the water table is. And if you hit <clears throat> rock, if you hit your shale, yeah. then you're not going through that. But we, we've dug wheat roots up 10 feet deep. So w roots will go a long way. And so your normal hay crop over three years, will it com correct a bunch of that if it's a uh, red clover timothy? Sure it will. Absolutely. Alfalfa is a little better because it's a little more aggressive taproot, but but it'll still fix it for sure. Yeah. Did we hear you right? You said you've seen wheat, wheat roots. Sorry, go ten feet deep. Yep. Okay. Yep. One other quick question: earthworms. You said all these things are good for earthworms to feed on, but how are earthworms? How effective are they in in breaking up compaction? So earthworms will absolutely because they, they hibernate, right? So we're talking, I gotta be careful, because there's different earthworms. But if you're talking the night crawlers, the big dew worms that you wanna go fishing with, so they don't actually feed on roots and whatnot, they feed on above ground parts of the plant. But in terms of correcting compaction, they're the ones that will burrow down and make that big channel, and they will go through the compaction. They will, because they gotta get deep enough that they, they don't die over the winter. So they are going at least generally, you know, 18 inches deep, something like that. So they'll burrow through, and they will help with that. And then the root will go down that channel, and if you have enough <coughs> earthworms, it helps with deep compaction. But it's still not enough. And, and Again, I come back and I, I gotta be really careful using my own experience too much. But on my farm, because I'm a no-till guy and I grow cover crops, I have enough earthworms that, that they actually pick earthworms off my farm. It's one of the best cash crops there ever was because they pay you in cash money, right? Like, if they pay, you gotta be a little careful. Sometimes you don't get paid. It's almost, almost like selling uh, hay to a horse farmer. You're just never 100% sure. <laughs> but when you get paid, it's cash money. It's all good. But I gotta have a lot of earthworms or they aren't picking them. Because they don't pick the babies. They only pick the big guys. And they, and even with them picking earthworms, I still ended up having to split tile. So do earthworms help? The answer is yes. Are they are they frequent enough to actually com com correct that? No, because they're putting a the channel down through, but they're not giving me they're not giving me that fracture for that lateral water movement. 
So they help absolutely, they're not the whole answer, all right? And, and by the way, my 10-foot wheat root, that was in a sandy soil, we traced it down. On average, I don't think they go that deep all the time, but what I will say is that it's not uncommon at all to find corn roots or, <coughs> or wheat roots or alfalfa roots at three, four, five feet, even six feet. So roots go fairly deep, right? That's, that's the point, right? Cool. So, yeah. I better start hurrying up or poor Ryan's going to have no time at all. So this is a problem, right? We, we talk about, about light equipment. That, that manure tanker is 50 ton. The tractor is nearly 30 ton. Equipment weights, tractor weights have gone up 900 pounds per year on average since 1965. So it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so here's the deal. If I'm driving that truck, that potato truck down the road, how heavy can I be on every axle? What's the legal limit? What's the legal limit? Oh, come on, you guys got to know. You load her up. You load her up. <laughs> and the MTO never catches you. Never. You have 5,500 kgs on your front axle. And yeah. 18 on the tandem, isn't it? Yeah, so I, uh, I've gotten different answers. Some uh, in Ontario, it's it's ten metric per axle, and I expect you guys are close. And maybe you're right. Maybe it's nine metric or whatever. But regardless, that's that's what it is. Uh, what you know? What are roads bu built for? Or why do why do we have that? Why do we have that limit? It's not to wreck the road, right? Do we build the roads purposely designed to take weight? Not here. We build them to replace them. I would argue that you know we at least the thought process should be we're building them to, to take the load, right? I'm trying to now. So that's ten ton per axle. Look at my axle weights over here. That I'm driving on a biological system. Does it make any sense at all? Right? So by the way, in Europe, in Europe, if, the, if it's a 10 ton per axle limit on trucks, it means your farm equipment cannot be more than 10 tons per axle. Everybody is limited to that. So driving down the road with that manure tanker, it can't be over 10 tons per axle. So if you're, if you're over 10 tons per axle, and you want to go, you know, want to keep taking that load and MTO stops you, what's your options? Don't fill it. Don't fill it or yes, don't no. stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are fun. More axles, thank you, more axles. So this is one of the things that we've not done in agriculture is say it's too heavy. Put on more axles. What about your tire width? So we'll get to that. Okay. All right. We will get to tire wood. Anyway. Are you so better with one one twenty ton or two ten ton axles? Yeah. I'm gonna shut that up. Sorry. Uh, um, so you're better off with two ten ton. <coughs> You'd be better off yet with four five ton. Right. So if, like, if we can get that axle weight down, it, it's just better. I will skip this. All that's shown is so. So there's my grain buggy, sixty thousand pounds payload in that grain buggy, and that's harvest. That's how much of the field he tracked, right? And I, why he went up into the bush? <laughs> <laughs> we won't. We won't go there. Anyway, yeah. So and that's even with tracks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it doesn't. So, so that doesn't matter whether he's got tracks or not. This is just how much of the field he's driven. Okay, sorry. Right? It's just so whether it's tracks or or tires, what doesn't matter. Misunderstood. Yeah. So this is just showing the problem. Here's the problem: the wheel load has continued to go up. The tire volume has kept pace, but my contact area over time has just not kept pace. So that's the problem, and that's why we're seeing more compaction. I will skip that just to, and all this says is there's 20 tons per axle. If I'm 20 tons per axle and the soil is wet, um, do this one, the soil is wet, it's a 20% yield loss. If I'm 10 tons per axle and it's wet, it's a 10% yield loss. 
So the heavier the axle, the more loss we're, we're getting into. So we're about here. That is what you call a bad day. That's a bad day. Thank you. That's an expensive oops. Yeah, that, I think he has to go back to school for his uh, forklift license again, right? Like, wow. So why are we at this? Oh, Lord. Why are we at this today? We're at this today because, you know, we've done all these different uh, events, and so we've done four different compaction events now. Uh, the, one, uh, two last year. Uh, we're going to do another one uh, this coming year, September the second, and near Peterborough, Ontario. If you if you're looking to, to take a little bit of vacation, it's a it's a really cool event. We run uh, at least seventy, maybe as many as ninety different configurations over our installations. I'll show you, show you those in a minute, but uh, it just it really will open your eyes. And and we think we have some answers because we're doing all this this work. And this is what it looks like at, at setup. So you'll see everything's loaded. So we're, everything is tested at maximum risk. And we have to weigh everything. And we, it's weight, speed, and, and air pressure. And so that's just kind of that setup. You know, everything gets a number so that we know what it is. And, and we run it over the scales. Oh, by the way, how many people in the room have weighed your equipment, tire by tire? So if you don't know the weight, you can't set the pressure in the tire, right? You just can't. And you, so we now have tire places that are offering weigh clinics. So you bring your equipment in, they'll have these pad scales there so that you can drive up on them and know what every tire weighs so that you can know what air pressure you set in the tire. How many people in the room set air pressure based on weight of the load? Nobody, right? We just, what do you do? You just make sure it doesn't bulge, right? If the tire's not bulging, it's all good. It's all bad. If the tire's not bulging and it's a radial tire, you simply are not utilizing the technology. You're not, like, you might as well not have a radial tire on. And you're paying for that technology and not allowing it to do what it can do for you in terms of reducing compaction. So it's really fun stuff. Uh, that's a track. You've got to get the boards on there, but we weigh tracks as well. And this is just the, the installation. So there's the, the equipment or partial equipment lineup. We actually did a lot more than that at that particular one, uh, the combines. This is the, so the installation is right here, and we drive the stuff over that installation. Uh, this, that's where the crowd sits. Alex Berry is one of the compaction team guys. He's an engineer. He's kind of done a lot of the, the grunt work, if you will, for figuring this out. Uh, we dig installations in like that, and then we insert these bowling probes. So all this, that is, and I'll show you a picture. I tried to, I tried to bring one on the plane, but they said it was a weapon. <laughs> so I couldn't bring it to show you. Uh, but it's a rubber tube, and we have to drive the equipment over that rubber tube. That's filled with water. And that just sends uh, to the computer uh, so that we can get good comparative numbers. Now, I know that, that Ryan had Odette Menard here and did a soil health day if you were there, and she buried these pipes in the soil and you drove over and the water sh shot out. This is a very similar, except it's a lot more sensitive, and we can get good comparative numbers between the different pieces of equipment. And so, essentially what we do is we drill into the soil, and then we insert the probe, by the way, drilling into the soil is way harder than you think. Pulling the drill out of the soil is unbelievably hard. Right? Like it's just you, crazy hard. But we do that at 6, 12, and 20 inches. So what we're trying to do is measure topsoil compaction, mid-subsoil compaction, where maybe we could fix it with deep tillage, but it's getting down there, and then stuff we can't fix. And when we, uh, so, uh, Alex, the Barry, the, the engineer, has actually come up with an installation where, where we don't have to dig the pit anymore. And so this is just all geometry, so we can actually do it a little bit more simply. But there's my, there's my probe right there. And so that's the part that we have to drive over, that little rubber tube, so we get that, that sensor. And then, yeah, the rest of this we'll just get. 
<coughs> it's what it looks like once we've done one of the installations. And so where the flag is, is where the sensors are, and just the probes are going in, and all three probes, one at 6, one at 12, one at 20. When we dig them up to take them out, uh, you know, that was supposed to be at 12 inches. Well, it's right on 12 inches. So it's working. We're pretty happy with that. Send it to the computer, and this is just one of the days. And you can see there's the installation, and there's my, where, my, where my sensor is. So we paint a red line in the ground, and then we actually have to make sure that we hit that with the, the uh, tractor. By, by the way, if you notice that, is the center of the track headed for that red, red line right there? Mm -hmm. No. Why not? Weights on the lug. Weights on the lug? No. It's a track. It packs more on the edge, doesn't it? No, because it's got bogies here and bogies here, roller here and roller oh. here. And if I hit it with the center of the track, right. I'll register almost nothing. Oh. So I actually have to hit the roller and the bogey. Mm -hmm. And so we've learned that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of fun from that perspective. And you can see we're filling the combine with with uh, wheat there. So you getting any difference, like compared to your first one? If you did your first one at the start of the day in the same rig at the end of the day after everybody went over that? Yep. So we have multiple installations, and we do multiple installations because we know that after about thirty runs, and each one's a little different, but after about thirty runs. Uh, we'll have it so that we no longer get good numbers. So the first thing we do once we install it, because we've driven a hole into the ground, because you can't drive the probe in, because it's this wimpy little piece of tubing. So we, the steel rod makes the hole, and the hole's a little bit bigger than, not much, but a little bit bigger than the probe, so you get the probe slid in there while the soil's not tight around that, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing you have to do is drive over it with a tractor to firm the soil around that probe. So we take a, a tractor that will work for that, and we drive over it, and then about every 10 runs over it, right? we might drive over its tractor three or four times till we get a stable reading, and then about every, run 10 different pieces of equipment, run that tractor again and say, is that reading still consistent? And after about 30 times, some, we've, we've, once we got as many as 40 passes over an installation before it went wonky. But we're we're we we're trying to do some quality control, okay? But good question. So that's just a tractor running over it. Uh, that's Alex uh, and his computer screen and what it looks like there. It, if you come to the day, September the second, we have these big screens set up. So when you're sitting in the stands, you can see what it looks like, and that's just uh, the stands and one of those days. And we have to like you have to kind of say, well, what are we aiming for? And we're not really measuring compaction, we're measuring what the tr the, how much pressure we're putting on that little tube. We think it relates to compaction very well, but I don't know how you exactly measure compaction. But what, you know, what are we trying to stay under? And so the numbers that we use, uh, and, and we they're fairly accepted across the globe, is about 15 PSI in the surface soil and about 7.5 PSI in the subsoil. And so it just happens that, that like all the Europeans use bars, they don't use uh, English measurements anymore, so one bar is 14 and a half PSI. Why, why, do I, why will I tolerate higher pressure, higher loads in the su surface soil than in the subsoil? Because you, you can do something about it, that's one thing. What else? Freeze thaw, yeah, a little bit. The bigger component is organic matter. So all the organic matter tends to be in the surface soil, right? Organic matter actually acts as a spring in the soil to give you that resiliency so that we can tolerate higher pressures there and it'll bounce back. We get 12 inches deep, there's essentially zero uh, organic matter and so it doesn't it isn't as resilient. And the higher the organic matter level, uh, and that, I mean, we use these as, as kind of lines in the sand. We really shouldn't because on a, on a peat soil, probably we could tolerate more than 14 PS or 15 PSI because it's so high in organic matter that it, it will bounce right back, right? You get that real sponge effect. But these are the numbers we use for most mineral soils, and, and it's fairly uh, decent. So we're about here. Well, 
know if that's Ryan on that uh, ATV or not. <laughs> you know, I, I've probably seen that video a hundred times because I use it in presentations. Every time I see it, I wonder how the guy didn't break his neck. Like, it's just bizarre. But I guess wet soil is fairly pliable. <laughs> you must have escaped from somewhere at that point. <laughs> anyway, so just to, to go to reiterate before we sh I show you the graphs and, and the comparative stuff, the equipment is fully loaded, so we're maximum risk, right? We weigh it because if you don't know the weight, you just can't do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And we set the tire pressure based on weight and speed. So the faster you go, the more pressure you need in a tire. <clears throat> And if you think about this, your potato truck, if you're going down the road and you got 15 PSI in the, in the tire, what's going to happen? Ah. Right. If you're going down the road at 100 PSI, what's going to happen? Should be fine. Do you need 100 PSI in the field at 5 kilometers an hour? If you're at 15 PSI, is that okay? The answer is maybe. It depends. A little low. Well, maybe. Maybe, but so so that like this speed thing is a big deal, and we've done nothing about that in agriculture, right? Absolutely nothing. And then we just we we some of the equipment we do both road inflation and field pressure. So here's what the graphs look like. And so we essentially have the six, twelve, and twenty. This will be the front axle of the tractor. This is the back axle of the tractor. And, and you can see those weights. That's where we think the threshold is, theoretical threshold. And so this we would say, well, that's pretty close. We maybe are okay, but it's dicey. And that is my line for the subsoil compaction. And there you would say, boy, that tractor by itself, without any load whatsoever, is heavy enough that I could be getting some, some compaction at depth that's causing me issues. Right? So that's how you read the graphs. So we'll buzz through some of this stuff. Uh, I think I think it's a bit of fun, but we're going. I'm getting long, long in the wind. I'm getting long winded here. <coughs> this is a bit unfair because we took this tractor and just unbolted the, the the duals off of it. Normally, if you put that dual on, it would be a little bit, or the single on it, be a little bit bigger tire. Anyway, that's just what you do in those days to to look at it. But you look at singles versus duals, which should be better? Duals, absolutely. So there it is, uh, the singles were here, just pretty close. The duals are absolutely better. And, you know, that would be just kind of what you would expect to see from that perspective, right? So no rocket science there. Pretty interesting that that tractor is heavy enough that that back axle at 12 inches deep is just, you know, maybe problematic. What happens when I start pulling a potato planter with that tractor? Absolutely. The draft, right? So the draft is going to put all sorts. And, and we haven't yet figured out how to do that, but we're going to try to do that with a tractor pull cart and a big long chain because we can't pull the cart over the sensor. But if we have that cart and a, a known load, then we can get that draft. We'll, fit, we'll be able to figure out how much worse that tractor would be in terms of you know, when it was hooked onto the potato planter or whatever it was. <coughs> and the other thing is that even with the duels, the duels made a big difference or a bigger difference in the surface soil, but as we go deep, it doesn't make nearly as much difference. And you will see that time and again. So air pressure is surface soil. Axle weight is depth. And so whether I have duals or singles, my axle weight is the same, so at depth, my compaction is, is very similar. Not exactly the same, but very similar. So that's kind of a, an interesting thought process uh, in terms of how that works. I'll skip this, another, another set of, of duals versus singles, just a little different. So have you heard about, uh, you know, control, or so, pardon me, central tire inflation systems, right? You know what those are? Yeah. Getting to be standard in Europe. So what we have here, you know that manure tanker that I showed you right at the, at the first? Well, this is uh, almost the same manure tanker. If it's loaded going down the road, I need 40 PSI. In the field, I need 15 PSI. Do you think it'll make a difference? 
How much difference? So there's the graphs. Now you got it. That's the tractor. So we missed the tractor. So ignore that. But there's my road versus my field. How much difference does that air pressure make? So this is scary stuff. If if I'm going down the road with that manure tanker or with my loaded potato truck, I have to have that high pressure in the tires. Do you lower the pressure when you go in the field? No. No? no? Right? No. <laughs> and if you don't, so that if I go in the field at road pressure, at 12 inches, I'm getting surface level compaction that's an issue. It's massive. At depth, right? I'm getting at 20 inches deep, I'm, I'm breaking that. Am I affecting lateral water flow? Absolutely. If I can cut that back to 15 PSI, oh, I'm still, I'm still heavy enough to be a bit of an issue, but it's so much better that it's, like, it just blows your brains in terms of how much better that is from a compaction standpoint. So does it make a difference? The answer is absolutely. It's huge. The next is bias ply versus radials. You know, you've got it there with a big square baler. You'd think, gosh, that doesn't cause much compaction. Well. Bias plies just, they don't give, right? The tire technology doesn't give it all. And so bias ply are way worse. And you know, that's the tractor, that's the, uh, uh, the baler itself. So the tractor is actually the same. It's on radials, you've got to ignore the tractor. But the radials do a much nicer job in terms of carrying that. And, and by the way, these are little wee radials, right? Like these are not massive big tires on a big square baler. You don't get massive big tires on a big square baler. They tend to be those little wee guys and still making a pretty big difference. If you're running bias ply tires, you can't do anything about compaction, full stop. You've got to at least use radials. What about duels versus singles, big singles? Which would be better? So it's a combine comparison. What do you think? Duels. Duels? Big singles? Yeah, so we didn't know actually. When we did the first compaction day, we absolutely didn't know. Uh, and so when we did this, so I'm, I'll show you the comparison, but these combines are very similar in total weight. <coughs> Notice that on the big single, I catch the steering axle. On the duels, I miss the steering axle, okay? So when I show you the pictures, you just gotta remember we missed the steering axle. So there's the outcome. My big single drive, my dual drive. That's the, the steering axle. Which is better? The big single. Why is the big single better than duals? More area. It's all about tire volume, right? So my big single has more air volume, and so it's able to spread its footprint over a bigger area. And so a big single is better than duels. Now, be careful with that. That big single is better than that set of duels. If instead of 650s, I went to 750 duels, then the duels might well be better than the big single. What about a big single going down the road at 8 PSI? How safe are you? Why not? Like, what's it doing, right? Woo, woo, woo. So big singles are great in the field, but if you're running at low pressure, they are not safe on the road. Whereas duels are much safer on the road. And again, it's that tire volume thing, right? It's how much give can, they, can you get. And so, uh, kind of an interesting thing. Notice that the steering axle is way worse than the drive. Mm -hmm. And if it's one thing that we have learned, is that the steering axle on the combine is really where the compaction happens. So you want to really fix that, you've got to actually work on the steering axle first. And that was kind of a surprise to us. We did not know that when we started this. But cool stuff. So what about uh, tracks? Better than tires or what do you think? No, yes, I'm getting both answers. So that, well, yes. by the way, with my tracks, why am I getting multiple bumps? The bogeys. Right, so it's roller, bogey, bogey, roller. And there's my steering axle. That combine is still the steering axle is the problem. So is it better or equal to the big singles? What do you say? They're the same. They're absolutely the same. 
So if you use the right tire, tracks are no better. If you use the wrong tire, tracks are a little more idiot proof, right? Or if I took that tire and had it over inflated, then the tracks would be better. But tracks cost more, there's a lot more maintenance, right? And they add weight. Tracks are heavy. So if I can do the same thing and do it right with a big single, it's going to be a cheaper solution than going to tracks. Right? So, uh, I think, uh, oh, you guys will all have sprayers, right? Your potato farmers, every, like good grief, 12 trips through the field, so probably the sprayer is one of those. So you either use big floaters or you're all using these skinnies, right? Yep. Because you On the tractors too. On the tractors too. So, yeah, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a necessity. It's a necessity. Interesting. <laughs> you ever, so, so you're running through the field with these skinny duels, right? Or singles. Skinny singles. Yeah. So the skinny singles might, if, if you can actually get the traction, like with this skinny singles, are, because then I'm only compacting here. But if I have skinny duels, what's happening to that row in between? You ever dig there and see what it looks like? You should try that sometime, because I'll tell you on a, on a platter, a corn platter, a CCS platter, right? So. The big hopper on the center of the unit and the wings and we've done all sorts of trials and we know that where the wheels are underneath the load we have a 30 to 50 bushel yield hit we take 30 to 50 bushels less yield because of compaction and it's the pinch row effect you get tires on each side of the row and the row in between just never performs because the, the compaction bubble from those two tires it's teardrop shaped it comes down and each tire, it comes out like this, it comes together and then you get no root growth through there, no water penetration. And, and so it's like 25% less yield. I bet money your potatoes are the same way. And so the other two sessions we gave this, it's been a great discussion. You know, do we give up? And, and Ryan will talk a little bit more about it too, I think, but do we give up 4% in yield because we take out that one potato row and now we run the big floaters but we don't <coughs> compact the rest of the field. We stay in that track all the time, and we gain six or eight or 20% yield in the rest of the field because we don't compact it. So controlled traffic is really something that I think you guys got to look at. Anyway, <coughs> run the big floaters. It's 35 versus 13 PSI, 35 on the road, 13 in the field. Makes a huge difference, right? So that's, that's the same as before. Now I'm going to look at the skinnies. The skinnies are 50 on the road versus 25 in the field. Going to make a big difference? Should, right? From everything I've shown you, it should? Yeah. Yeah. Very little difference. Because they're too narrow, I can't get a big enough footprint. And so I don't, I mean, I gain, you know, that's, that's 40. Uh, this is 30, but my break point is 15, so who cares? It's a gain, but it's not enough gain because I just can't get that footprint. Okay, so... Can you, can you go back to the spare just for a second? Yep, That's absolutely. What you're saying, what you're saying. So you're saying if we took out those rows, put in tray models, that the yield increase would offset losing two pay rows. Yeah, yeah, so, the, the, so go through this thought process with me. Um, oh, sorry, I did do that one. If you never track that, that part of the field at all, how much would the yield go up? Any ideas? And so think about this. Go to the fence row, take a steel pail, cut the bottom out of it, drive that steel pail into the soil, and then take a gallon of water and dump the gallon of water in. How fast will the water infiltrate? Usually very quick. Yep. Go to where you have a, that track, Drive the pail in, dump the water, how fast will the water infiltrate? Go into the field where you haven't tracked and pound that in, how quick will the water infiltrate? Better. Better. Which is the best? Fence, Fence row. Yeah. So actually at the very first meeting, there was a, one of the growers there, or one of the, I'm, I'm not sure who it was, Ryan's not in the room right now, but uh, they did that. 
They actually did that trial. And in the track, it was a gallon and a half in an hour that would infiltrate. In the fence row, it was five gallons. So three times as much infiltration. And in the field in general, I think it was three or three and a half gallons, so about twice, where they didn't track. So if you think about that, and there's guys in, well, in, in, uh, in Australia, they do controlled traffic all the time. Because they've learned that by doing controlled traffic and not compacting out in the field, they make it like the fence row. And so I, I gain 10 or 20% yield by never tracking there. So if I, if I give up that 120 foot boom, I give up two rows, what's that, 4% of the field? I, you'd have to do the math. But can I give up 4% in yield because I get zero yield there, but I gain 10% in yield on the rest of the field, so I'm 6% ahead. And my end yield is actually higher than as if I cropped the whole field. And Ryan has said at every other meeting that, that in his research plots, they never ever harvest the rows in the track, like in between the tracks, because that is where you get the, the odd shapes, the cull potatoes, lower yield, like he thinks it's 33, 35 to 40% lower yield. He's just, just guessing, but from what he's seen. And so it just, it's a thought process, right? But it's something I think you could look at that, yeah, you keep that compaction in that row and then you get much higher yields because you haven't tracked the rest of that field. Okay? Thank you. No, it's good. Yep. And back in 1970, issue of National Geographic, February or March, I forget which, but it showed on the last page, it was about the revolution in agriculture, but the last page showed what it was supposed, what it would likely look like early in the 21st century, okay? And this was the futurist. Anyway, the the fields were there was a, a bridge work across the fields. All the tillage and the combining and everything was done with no compaction at all, okay? And the thing is, it's uh, theoretically it's a good idea. No, I don't know if they ever figured out the cost of the bridge work. <laughs> yeah, no, probably the. So, so actually, what's what we're trying to do here is just figure out how to how to reduce that that level of compaction. We'll skip this because we talked about it. Other than look at this, would you run those those tires in the field? Would your equipment dealer let you? Would the tire guy let you? So this is the mindset change. So Daryl Burnett is one of our Ontario compaction team guys, and he says if I'm in the field and it doesn't look like the tires on the rim, there's too much pressure in the tire. And he would say that absolutely that's the, and by the way, those tires are, are uh, warrantied at that pressure, at the speed that they're going in the field. And does that make a big difference in compaction? And the answer is for sure, there's the difference, right? So there's 40 PSI, and there's the, my field PSI, and I go from big problems at the, at the six and tw 12 inch level <coughs> to no problem at all, at least at the six inch level, right? Way, way better. Massive differences. So that's how you really solve compaction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'll finish up really quickly. It's been a great discussion, by the way. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, but there is new tire technology. And so you'll get IF tires now. IF tires just stand for increased flex. And so it's in the sidewall. So start looking at your tires a little differently. Because if you want a tire that's really going to flex, you need a high sidewall. Right? Because if it's going to get a bigger footprint, it's got to be able to give. And the only way, if you look, if you have this much of the sidewall, you go to one of these LSW tires, an LSW tire, do you get flotation? Sure, because they're all five feet wide. But you don't get any real increase in flotation at any pressure because they've got no sidewall to give. Whereas a, a Michelin Evo bib or an IF, a VF tire, we've gone to really high sidewalls so that they can give a lot. They give a lot, they increase my footprint. So the IF tires are 20% more weight or 20% less pressure 
The VF tires are 40% more weight or 40% less pressure. And then central tire inflation is one of those things you really have to start looking at. Have those systems gotten any better? I know we looked at them back probably five years ago. It just took for potato trucks. And it just took so long to increase those pressures leaving the field and getting on the road. Yes, and the answer is yes, they've gotten way better. So in terms of, uh, and, and so match that central tire inflation system to what you need. And, and if you have to inflate quickly, then the systems now have tanks. So when you dump the air, the air goes into pressure tanks. And when you refill that tire, it fills, it, it'll fill back up to you know 60 PSI quite quickly from the pressure tanks. And then the compressor kicks in to take it up the last 20 while you're gearing up going down the road. Uh, on a manure tanker, it's the opposite. You have to dump fast because you get to that field, you want them to empty fast. And so uh, the agribrink system dumps really, really quickly. But they, they're way better than they were five years ago. Absolutely, right? But, but match, you gotta pick the right system for what you need. So this is the one other thing that I think is really interesting. Everybody thinks on radial tires that you get a bigger footprint because they go wide. That bulge never comes in contact with the soil. A radial tire gets more footprint by going long. <coughs> so this just shows you that. that. That line is the same width on every one of those pictures. So there's the tire at 31 PSI, that's the footprint. If I drop it to 18 PSI, it doesn't go wider, but I get 20% more footprint by going longer. I go to an IF tire, I get 33% more footprint because I've increased my flexion in the sidewall, but it's all <coughs> length. It's all length, it's not width. And that's, that's different than what most people think. And we talked about this, you gotta know the weight. You gotta know the weight, once you know the weight, and you, I mean, you start with your tire, you know the weight, then you figure out what speed you're going, and that's how you figure out the pressure. And that's a really complicated graph, but that's how you do it. And you can go to the Toronto, Tur Toronto website, it's a Swiss website, and it has a lot of that information on it. It'll help you do that. Work with your tire guys, because your tire guys can access those, those charts and make that difference. I will skip all this stuff. Yeah. Be careful, are those good flotation tires or not? They look pretty wide, right? Mm -hmm. They say flotation on the side. Oh, where'd it go? Oh yeah, it says flotation, there it is, on the side. Mm -hmm. So there's what the, uh, if you can see there what the tire actually says, what's the problem? There's no R. Oh, no, no. no. Right? So those are not flotation tires, never will be. The guy that bought that wagon brought it to one of our compaction days. We could not make it work, and then we finally realized they aren't radial tires. He was so mad that the dealer, he took it back, and the dealer put on radial tires for him. Anyway, so the, what's the best compaction fighting tool? What do you think? Mindset. Mindset? Yeah, that's a good one. Biggest one is this. How many of you have uh, checked your tire pressure uh, every week in season, on every piece of equipment. You do? Good man. Oh, no, no, I no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Once per season. Once per season. <laughs> Once. Or if so, you are, they go flat. You might want to check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's really interesting is at these compaction days, farmers bring in, and, and thankfully they do, they bring in their own equipment for us to test. And it is not uncommon for us to find the inside dual flat. Oh. Or the outside dual at 10 PSI, the inside dual at 40 PSI. Mm -hmm. At the Dundas Compaction Day, one of the large growers brought some equipment there, was so mad about stuff that he went home. That night he checked every, the air pressure in every piece of equipment that he had. <coughs> Three flat tires on, on equipment he thought was ready to go to the field. Now this is ridiculous. Because every morning at home, when I start my pickup truck, it tells me if I have a soft tire. Mm -hmm. The technology exists that we could know if we have a flat tire. We just haven't done it. And we haven't asked the equipment dealers for it. So we got to start pushing them that this is important. We need to know. And I will tell you that, that I understand Case IH or Case New Holland, call them what you will. Uh, on the new tractors coming out in 2020, uh, the, the larger models series are going to have Bluetooth technology to send air pressures to your phone. It won't come up on the dash, but you'll be able to access it off your phone. 
So we're maybe getting there, but tire pressure drives everything. And if you if you can't sense it, like how, what the heck, right? Anyway, gotta weigh them, and then of course patience, right? Patience is a virtue as long as you can have it. Uh, that helps. But remember, because this is this is important. I I can have the very <coughs> best tire technology, the very best VF tire there is on the market. If I overinflate it, it's useless. A standard radial that is properly inflated is better than an overinflated VF tire. If you don't use the right air pressure, you simply aren't using the technology. And are VF tires better than radials? Yes, they are, but only if you run them at the right air pressure. So my last uh, go around here and, and then we're done is just to, to give you a little bit more background on these central tire inflation systems. So if I'm on the road, does the tire roll easier if it's inflated or if it's half flat? Inflated. If I'm in the field, does the tire roll easier if it's inflated or half flat? Half flat. Half flat. So what you, what you don't realize or you don't see is that you get a 15% fuel economy by using central tire inflation systems because they're pumped up on the road and they're soft in the field. And this is my example. You can argue with me about, do your own example, but if I assume my tractor's running 1,000 hours and it burns 20 liters per hour in fuel, I save about 2,400 bucks a year, right? Just in fuel savings. And what was really interesting is we were at, at supper last night, and I think it was Robert, wasn't it, uh, Ryan, that said that he, uh, he at, the, at the right pressure he saved, or he went an hour and a half longer on a tank of fuel. On a tank of fuel when he had his tires soft in the field. An hour and a half longer, that's a long time, right? So this is real. The other thing is that you get less tire wear, because if they're pumped up on the road, you're getting less tire wear than as if they're half flat. If they're half flat in the field, you're getting less slip, and so they last longer. So 20% more tire wear. My example is a $4,000 tire, and I get one more year out of it, that's 533 bucks. So that, just in fuel savings, and in tire wear alone, I gain $3,000 a year. And they cost twenty-five dollars to 30000 bucks. so just in fuel savings and tire wear, it's a 10-year payback, and that's nothing for the yield increase by less compaction. That's saying that doesn't even exist, which is wrong. So these central tire inflation systems make way more sense than what people think. Kind of cool stuff. So weight is the issue. Uh, you want to take action on compaction and I'm done. Weight is the enemy. It's tires, it's pressure, it's tire technology, but it's using the right air pressure. That's the main one. You can look at tracks. I mean, there's nothing wrong with tracks. <coughs> good solution, but they're expensive. They don't go down the road as fast, but there's some issues with them as well. More axles. On grain buggies, man, we are putting more and more axles because it's the only way to spread the weight. And what, what does a track do? It really gives you more axles. So the roller's an axle, the bogey's an axle, the bogey's an axle, the roller's an axle, right? We're getting more axles under there. And then uh, central tire inflation systems. With that, you know, if we do enough things, uh, we're, we're going to get there. And uh, I'm done unless there's questions. I'll let